Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Herrera, and I'm one of the cardiac anesthesiologists here at Methodist. And this morning, it is my honor and privilege to introduce my former mentor, Dr. John Kellum, uh, who was kind enough to visit us from uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where he is um, endowed chair of critical care research and has a special interest in acute kidney injury. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Kellum. Thank you. Uh, Facebook Live, huh? <laughs> yeah, wow, that's great. That's great. So um, uh, I titled this talk, I, I, was, I was telling some folks a moment ago, I titled this talk, uh, Is Kidney Injury After Cardiac Surgery Real? for a couple of, of reasons. I, we, we, one, of our, uh, one of our residents uh, came onto the service recently. I work in a cardiothoracic ICU in Pittsburgh and, and uh, actually said to me, he said, you know, cardiothoracic surgery associated AK, is, is that a thing? And uh, I, I, so I almost titled this, yeah, it's a thing, it's a thing. Uh, the, the second reason is that um, uh, as you look at the epidemiology of this disorder, some very interesting thing, and I'll, I'll go over that in, in some detail, and, and, and there are ways of defining acute kidney injury uh, which make it look really problematic uh, in terms of the outcomes for patients, and there are ways of defining acute kidney injury that make it far more common uh, but perhaps less clinically relevant, and it's different than other sorts of uh, acute kidney injury arising in other kinds of uh, uh, conditions, and I think that's uh, something we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about. My disclosures are uh, there. I am going to talk about some of the products these companies make. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about biomarkers uh, uh, made by uh, companies like Astute Medical and, and Bioporto. Um, there's, a, there's a conference proceedings that I hope to be published soon. Uh, maybe there's a, maybe, maybe reviewer two is in the audience and you can kind of move this along. We're still waiting for uh, the f sort of final uh, uh, publication uh, to come out. But this was a, a meeting we had in Croatia uh, last year uh, that involved uh, cardiac surgeons, uh, cardiac anesthesiologists, intensivists, nephrologists uh, from around the world and, and really trying to get uh, uh, so, sort of the needle moved a little bit in this area because if you look at some of the guidelines and I'm not going to critique the guidelines but if you look at some of the guidelines they're really based on evidence that's uh, now getting pretty old and, and, the, and we really haven't moved uh, the needle very far in terms of reducing uh, acute kidney injury in the setting of cardiac surgery. Now by way of background one of the, the studies that I uh, referred to um, uh, for just about any purpose, if, as I'm designing studies for uh, cardiac surgery associated AKI or if I'm giving talks on the topic, uh, I, I refer often to this study by, by Emmett Garg and, and, and company, which was an analysis where they looked at a uh, trial of on-pump versus off-pump cabbage, as, as many of you uh, no doubt uh, remember. Um, and they analyzed the effect specifically on kidney injury. And they did a very nice job of looking at uh, the impact of on-pump versus off-pump cabbage on acute kidney injury, looking at it a variety of different ways. Now, for those of you, uh, and, 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 and uh, I'm going to assume that the vast majority of you in the room um, know this better than I do, but you're not comparing uh, cardiopulmonary bypass to no cardiopulmonary bypass. You're comparing two different procedures, really, off-pump and, and on-pump. But nevertheless, they were able to show a significant decrease in acute kidney injury when they, when they did an off-pump technique versus a, a, an on-pump technique. But there are some very interesting features to this. One of them is that um, the primary outcome for this analysis was AKI within 30 days. 30 days. So it's hard to understand how uh, cardiopulmonary bypass is going to affect differences in, in AKI occurring two, three, four weeks after uh, the case. So it was surprising, actually, they were able to demonstrate a statistically significant effect. And lo and behold, there was about a 3.5% absolute risk reduction associated with uh, using an off-pump technique versus an on-pump technique in terms of AKI. And it translated to about a 16% relative risk reduction. But look at this. If you look at 48 hours, which would have been the endpoint that I would have chosen, most of the studies uh, that we've been designing recently for interventions in the OR or pre-OR interventions, we look at AKI within 72 hours at most. And the reason is, is you can't really expect any intervention that you're doing in the OR or prior to the OR to have an impact on things that happen well down the road. And you can see this really bears that out because you have exactly the same 
absolute risk reduction, 3.5%. So all of the rest of the AKI, the other third of the AKI that occurs within 30 days, is occurring after this initial effect and has no impact on whether or not you do an on-pump or an off-pump uh, technique. And the lesson there is that acute kidney injury occurring in the setting of cardiac surgery occurs for a variety of different reasons. Some of it is related to the surgery itself. Some of it is related to the patients that we operate on. Some of it is, and the things that happen to them before they go to the OR. Some of it is related to things that happen well downstream after the OR. And a simple solution, like taking away the cardiopulmonary bypass, is unlikely to have a significant effect on all these various uh, features. And so to really understand this, we've got we've to really uh, uh, look under the hood and really get into why uh, cardiac surgery associated AKI is occurring. And of course, if you look even further out, if you look at what happens at one year, for example, the signal is completely now lost in terms of any protection associated with uh, doing an off-pump technique. Of course, the study was underpowered to look at that three, three and a half percent absolute risk reduction uh, going out that, that far. The second thing is, is that defining acute kidney injury by serum creatinine is problematic. Defining acute kidney injury by urine output is problematic. Um, using both urine output and creatinine together is problematic, although we can get we can, we can uh, uh, get much more insight into what's going on if we look at both of those. And so this is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it. Um, so what I have uh, along the, the, the columns here uh, are urine output criteria by itself, okay? which of course you would never use, but, but urine output criteria by itself. Um, and so we have no AKI in this column. We have stage one, stage two, stage three, just by urine output criteria. And across the rows, we have serum creatinine criteria, which are used by many studies, uh, and, and, and clinically, many people think creatinine has uh, more value than urine output criteria for defining acute kidney injury. We have no AKI, stage one, stage two, stage three. So the first thing to recognize is that if you have no AKI by either criteria, you have the best outcome. You have no dialysis, and you have a 4.3% uh, mortality. Now, this is not just cardiac surgical patients. This is 32,000 ICU patients. It includes sepsis patients, trauma patients. It's, it's across the boards. And if you have both stage three by both urine output and creatinine criteria, you have the worst outcome. You have a 50% mortality and you have a 50% rate of renal replacement therapy. But what is interesting is that if you incorporate both urine output and creatinine criteria, you get some interesting uh, results. For example, if you have stage two uh, uh, your, uh, AKI by creatinine and you just add a little bit of oliguria, your mortality doubles. Mortality doubles. And you can see that a lot of this, and I've color coded this in a way uh, that you can sort of see as you move from the green down to this dark red, um, there are uh, many cells that have very high mortality, hospital mortality, and rates of renal replacement therapy. There's also this cell up here where you have this sort of isolated oliguria. The AKI signal uh, is not manifest by serum creatinine, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, and at least for stage three, although arguably even stage two, where you have a doubling of the hospital mortality, uh, perhaps not, although this is statistically significant in this large N, um, perhaps, perhaps this difference isn't so uh, significant, but certainly by the time you get to stage two uh, criteria, just by urine output, no creatinine change at all, um, you have a, a, a significant adverse effect on mortality. And this persists, these patterns uh, persist for uh, up to one year, uh, perhaps longer. This is as much as we looked at in this particular, uh, in this particular study. Now, this has been poo-pooed by many of us in critical care, uh, in, as well as other fields. This is the Christmas edition of uh, the, uh, the BMJ uh, some years ago, where they actually looked at rates of oliguria in their uh, house officers. And uh, you know, the BMJ Christmas at issue is this sort of tongue-in-cheek sort of, uh, and, they, and, they, and they found that uh, doctors actually have a much higher risk of oliguria uh, than their patients, but to have surprisingly uh, very low mortality. Uh, and and so, so, that was, uh, so that was the conclusion uh, of this study. But, but this is actually very helpful to understand because in point of fact, you, you don't expect the house officers uh, to be getting 
two and a half to three liters of fluid intravascularly every day, but that's what your ICU patients get. Um, so when your house officers are a little oliguric uh, by these criteria, it's not because uh, their kidneys are failing, it's because they don't need to make that much urine. If I have an ICU patient, in the first day of, I, of an ICU stay, and I haven't separated this out for cardiac surgery, uh, and, and as I'll show you in a minute, cardiac surgery is a very different animal, not so much what happens in the ICU, but what happens just before they arrive to the ICU, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but if you just look at the ICU patients, the average daily volume load that patients receive, if you total up all the drips, if you total up all of the uh, fluids that the patients get, it's about two and a half liters a day after the first day. The first day, it's 3.2 liters of volume. So if you're not making much urine, you, you may not need it for the solute clearance, but you're going to be fluid overloaded, almost, almost, unless you start out in a very dry uh, situation, which, which we will uh, talk about in a minute. This is a, a sort of another piece of evidence. This is uh, some work that came out of doing uh, some database work, and this sort of a surprising outcome came out. Uh, we, we noticed that for patients that have acute kidney injury, but not for patients that don't develop acute kidney injury, whether the, whether the chart is complete in terms of urine output monitoring had an impact on or association uh, with mortality. If you had very careful urine output charting, all these patients had Foley catheters. The data was potentially available, but if it was charted very well in the notes, up, you know, at least every two hours uh, in the chart, the outcome associated with that uh, patient, if they developed acute kidney injury, was better than if you didn't chart carefully. And we, you know, this was, and, and this was a kind of surprising finding. Why would this uh, be the case? You looked at things like fluid overload as an example, and we found that patients that received what we called intensive urine output monitoring, where urine output was, was tracked carefully, they actually received less fluid, which surprised me because I thought, well, surely if the nurses are trending the urine output very carefully, they're calling for you know, fluid boluses if it's low. But in, in point of fact, what we found was if you're very carefully monitoring what happens to these patients in terms of their I's and O's, you're actually less likely to create uh, fluid overload uh, in the first uh, 72 hours. And, and uh, even restricting patients uh, to those developing AKI, the signal got even stronger in terms of fluid uh, balance. But let's talk about cardiac surgery. So we looked at all this data in general uh, ICU. Uh, of course, they're not general ICUs. They're subspecialty ICUs in, in, in Pittsburgh. But uh, we looked at it without consideration of the uh, underlying disease process or what unit they were in. So um, with some funding uh, from a, a, a drug company that's trying to develop um, uh, therapies for uh, one of those trials that I mentioned that I was uh, designing, uh, we did some database work to simulate to understand what impact the various outcomes for acute kidney injury would have and how, because you have to know what the frequency of the, end, of the endpoint is. If I say, well, I want to reduce AKI and I want to call any AKI, stage one uh, through stage three by creatinine or urine output criteria, if that's my endpoint, I need to know how often that happens and what impact it has on hard clinical endpoints so that when I talk to the FDA about the fact that the drug has some risk, I want to know that uh, I'm impacting uh, significant uh, patient uh, outcomes. It's equally or conversely, if I make my outcomes harder and I make the, make the, the criteria for the endpoint uh, harder, meaning that it's a worse outcome and it's clearly associated with adverse outcomes for patients, then the frequency declines and my endpoint now, my, my outcomes are uh, decreased. And that's a problem for study design. If I have a, an event rate of 30%, that's very different than an event rate of 3%. And so all of that has to sort of feature in. But we learned some things about the epidemiology of cardiac surgery. And this isn't published yet, so you're actually the first ones to see it. Uh, so this is kind of hot off the press. So we looked at a, a source population of 122,000 patients. Obviously, those patients didn't all receive cardiac surgery. Um, uh, 7,000 received cardiac surgery and, and uh, uh, by excluding various 
uh, types of cases uh, that we really would want to exclude transplants and things like that. We got down to 6,600 uh, 6, cases of cardiac uh, surgery. And this was across five hospitals in Western Pennsylvania that all share the same electronic medical record system. So the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, which hasn't even called that anymore, it's just UPMC. It's a bit like the Borg, if you think about uh, Star Trek, right? So it's our Star Wars, yeah, Star Trek, was it? Yeah, Star Trek. And so uh, the, 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 it's trying to basically uh, conquer the, the, the world and, and assimilate everybody onto the same. So they've done that for many hospitals in Western Pennsylvania. In fact, almost all the hospitals in Western Pennsylvania um, are uh, part of the UPMC uh, uh, enterprise. And uh, so the advantage for us as researchers are that they're all in the same electronic medical records. So I can harmonize all of the data from these various uh, centers and I can pool it together so I have a really large data set to analyze uh, things like cardiac surgery associated AKI. The other advantage is, is they're very different hospitals, right? So we have uh, a hospital up in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is a sort of a rural community hospital. We have inner city uh, hospital, Mercy Hospital. Uh, I don't know if you ever rotated at Mercy Hospital, Elizabeth, but you know, that's a, that's a very uh, inner city uh, uh, hospital. We have a suburban community hospital on the north side. We have the big university academic hospital, although we do less cases of standard cardiac surgery in that, in that center and a big community hospital where we do a lot of cases. So it's a nice mix of all of those kinds of different uh, hospitals. And here I have hot off the press. Um, the, this is the result of, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this. This is the result with the same analysis I showed you for all patients, uh, regardless of their, you know, mixing them all together. This is just cardiac surgery. And the epidemiology is different. So it's similar in, in, in regards to that same pattern of uh, you know, very low mortality with no AKI by either criteria going to very high uh, mortality and rates of renal replacement therapy. In fact, the numbers look very similar. We have about 50% um, 90 day uh, mortality and about uh, uh, 25%, I'm sorry, about 50% um, uh, renal replacement therapy and about 25%, um, 26% uh, 90 day mortality if you're down in this uh, and if you pool them together, death or dialysis occurs in about 60% of patients who make stage three criteria by both urine output and serum creatinine. But there are some surprises. The first surprise um, is that um, you don't really have isolated azotemia in cardiac surgery. And I didn't know this, although it smacks, it smacks true in terms of the patients that I I care for. I don't see patients rising their serum creatinine in the cardiothoracic ICU without, a, without profound oliguria. It just doesn't seem to happen. And in fact, these data would suggest that if you have a patient who's had cardiac surgery and they have a creatinine that's going up and they're making plenty of urine, it's probably not cardiac surgery associated AKI. You should be looking at their drug list. You should be look at, trying to rule out some other cause of acute kidney injury because it just doesn't happen. You can see that um, the frequency of this in this 6,000 patient database, all of these together uh, amount to less than 1%. So it's just a rare phenomenon. The second thing you'll notice is that the, although the same pattern that we see where the addition of urine output to creatinine seems to matter, it only matters in cardiac surgery when I talk about severe oliguria. So if I have just stage two oliguria, for example, if I go from this cell to this cell, the numbers really don't change in terms of death or dialysis. It isn't until I get to stage three oliguria where it seems to really impact the, uh, the outcome. And that's also seen in the isolated oliguria. So if I have stage one isolated oliguria, it's not any different, not any different. No azotemia now, no change in serum creatinine, just six hours of oliguria after cardiothoracic surgery has no impact at all on any long-term outcomes. And in fact, although this starts to approach, and I didn't actually compare that, this might be statistically significant, uh, going from a death or dialysis rate of 2.4% to 4% at 90 days, um, even stage two oliguria doesn't seem to have much of an impact on any hard clinical endpoints. And of course, all of you who've um, you know, been engaged in the enterprise of cardiac surgery know that there are lots of things that happen, particularly toward the end of the case, um, where you can manipulate intravascular volume quite well. And, and our, our cases often come out very dry. Um, 
because the perfusionists just take off volume uh, at the end of the case. The anesthesiologists crank up the norepinephrine and the patient comes out and they're underfilled. And the nurses then in the ICU give fluid back for the next uh, 12 hours. It's just sort of how we practice. Uh, whether that's right or wrong is a totally separate issue, but the notion that you're an output in the first 24 hours of uh, post-cardiac, at least in our hands, post-cardiac surgery, unless it's profound oliguria, stage three, by the way, the criteria for stage three is 24 hours of oliguria or anuria. So we're talking about uh, a much more significant. Uh, uh, now it does happen, about 6%, 5.5% of all of our patients have this isolated, they never raised their serum creatinine, and they have profound oliguria. And their mortality is, is four times uh, that of patients without any AK. Now why does that happen? Um, so first of all, a few things about, I hear these, these all the time about Lasix. Um, so I thought I would address it before I get to the impact of isolated oliguria. Um, your output criteria is meaningless because patients get Lasix. That's not true. Um, it turns out that you cannot take a patient who's got a dead kidney and, uh, and, and make urine out of it. In fact, the reason the furosemide stress test works is because the uh, furosemide has to get into the kidney through intact tubular organic uh, uh, transport. And if you can't do that, um, you will not respond to Lasix. The converse is also important. Patients who respond to Lasix are not hypovolemic. That's not true either. You can be profoundly hypovolemic and you have normal kidney function. You will still respond to Lasix because Lasix inhibits tubular glomerular feedback. And so your natural protective mechanism, at least one of them, uh, for uh, not diuresing in a set setting where you shouldn't, is overridden by furosemide. So uh, neither of these things is true. So urine output still is quite valuable, but it looks like in cardiac surgery, it's only really valuable when it's profound, when you have profound oliguria. If you have an isolated oliguria, it's not terribly profound. It doesn't seem to have a big impact. Now, why is that? Well, it turns out that um, just like uh, the, the story of myocardial infarction. So when I was a, a medical house officer some time ago. Um, we, uh, we, we didn't have non-STEMIs back then. You know, we had, we had atypical angina, and we, if you didn't have Q waves, you, just, you, know, you didn't really have an MI. You know, we called it other things. And that's gradually changed so people understand that. Uh, and of course, we've been aided by certain biomarkers, and, all, and, and that, that, uh, that corollary is, is here as well. Uh, but we understand now there are patients that develop um, a uh, myocardial infarction who don't have a, uh, you know, have a full on uh, ST segment elevation. Uh, and the same is true for the kidney. You can have uh, small changes, and they're not so small, in fact, changes in uh, renal uh, injury that don't uh, result in changes in serum creatinine. And in fact, for, for all of us sitting here today, for those of us, and hopefully it's all of us, who have normal renal function, you have to lose a substantial amount, up to half of your functional renal mass, before your creatinine even goes up. And we know this is true because you can donate a kidney, right? So, so a healthy person can donate one of their kidneys, and the creatinine bumps slightly for the first three or four days, comes right back down to normal. Creatinine is totally normal when you've lost half your functional renal mass. So when you see a change in creatinine, uh, in a patient, uh, and it's from acute kidney injury, that already tells you that there's been substantial loss of functional renal mass, or they've started out at an elevated uh, baseline. In other words, if you have chronic kidney disease and you have a small injury, your creatinine goes up. If you have no chronic kidneys, you can have a large insult and your creatinine doesn't go up. So despite the fact that your output is very nonspecific, there are patients that manifest significant AKI only by changes in urine output. Let me say that again. There are patients who have totally normal renal function by creatinine, who have lost substantial number of nephrons by an AKI event. And the only way you see that with clinical parameters is oliguria. You will see it by biomarkers. And we have several now that are available. Um, this is NGAL. NGAL goes up 
reliably in the setting of uh, acute kidney injury in cardiac, this is from cardiac surgery. The problem with NGAL is it goes up in patients that don't develop. Uh, uh, it doesn't go up quite as much, but the differentiation is not as good as we would like, and so it's, it's, a, it's now, it may be that patients who have an NGAL rise in the setting of cardiac surgery who don't develop AKI, they still have some subclinical injury. They have a non-STEMI going on in their kidneys, possibly but it's difficult to sort that out for patients with um, uh, undergoing cardiac surgery. We have better biomarkers in terms of sensitivity specificity, a uh, marker that I was involved in uh, in terms of its validation uh, is, uh, is this biomarker, which is a panel, it's called Nefercheck is the uh, trade name. Uh, it's a combination of urinary uh, tissue inhibitor metalloproteases two, an insulin-like growth factor. Uh, binding protein uh, 7, and it discriminates very nicely, and it does not go up in patients that don't go on to develop acute kidney injury. In fact, this little dip here that you see in this study by, by uh, uh, Melanie Mersch from, uh, from Germany, this is actually something we commonly see uh, where not only does the acute kidney injury biomarker go up when you develop acute kidney injury, but in the patients who don't develop acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery, it actually goes the other way, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but there's clear discrimination between the two. It's not limited to cardiac surgery. This is any uh, surgery, and the vast majority of these cases were either vascular or general uh, surgery, and you see this interesting kinetic where patients who develop acute kidney injury, this is stage two or three, this is stage one, and this is patients without any uh, evidence of AKI. Now, what are these markers for those of you who, I mean, if you're like me, you know, when you, when you heard tissue inhibitor of metalloproteases 2 and insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7, you said, of course, tissue inhibitor. No, I, yeah, I didn't say that. I said, what are these markers? Uh, you know, we did this study. We, we, looked at seven, we looked at 340 different biomarkers in the urine and the blood in patients with uh, uh, acute kidney injury from all kinds of different causes. And, um, and when we uh, unmasked the results, uh, and I was told these were the markers, I had no idea why they would be uh, markers of acute kidney injury, and started looking into the mechanism and realized, so this is the result, this is the uh, 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 usual suspects, things like NGAL, et cetera, and here's the ROC curve for tissue inhibitor proteases two times insulin growth factor binding protein 7. Um, when you start looking into the mechanism of action of these particular biomarkers, which is relevant to our discussion today, is these are actually not markers of damage the way troponin is a marker of damage to the heart, or NGAL, for that matter, is a marker of damage for the kidney. Um, these markers are stress markers, and we know that through a variety of different reasons. Um, one of them is, is that we understand uh, the, from mechanistically that these two markers overlap in terms of regulating cell cycle. That's the two things that they do which are in common. They have very d diverse uh, effects in, in biology, but the two places where they intersect, or the one place they intersect, is control of cell cycle. Now, why is that important? So you have to remember the epithelium in the kidney. The kidney, the tubules are lined by an epithelium, okay? Just like the epithelium uh, in your skin and, and various, so it's exposed to the environment. Now, you don't think of the inside of the kidney as being exposed to the environment, but it's an epithelium. And these cells respond to environmental stress. They respond to UV radiation. Urine, uh, uh, renal cells, renal epithelial cells respond to UV radiation, despite the fact they haven't seen sunlight in, in, in quite a few million years of evolution, but they'll respond to UV radiation. So they respond to a variety of stressors. Things that come across the glomerulus, proximal tube epithelial cells have G-coupled receptors, some of which uh, look like olfactory receptors. The kidney literally smells and tastes what's coming across the glomerulus and responding to that uh, in a variety of ways. One of the ways it responds to that is when it sniffs out something noxious, a non-steroidal, um, sepsis, something coming across a damp uric acid, HMGB1, something coming across the glomerulus which is noxious. One of its responses is to stay out of cell cycle. Why? Because just like your epithelial cells in your skin stay out of cell cycle when you're exposed to UV radiation, you get a sunburn, is because if the DNA is damaged, the, cell, the daughter cells weigh apoptose. And so epithelial cells have a hair trigger response to stay out of cell cycle whenever they're stressed. 
It's like I tell my children, reproduction is a dangerous and expensive thing to do. Don't do it unless you're ready. And the epithelial cells have the same, have the same response. It's dangerous because of the uh, daughter cells will die if they're injured. It's also extremely expensive bioenergetically. Reproducing all of your DNA is just about the most expensive thing any cell can do. And so it doesn't like to do that unless it knows the environment is safe. So what these markers are telling us is that the kidney thinks, to the extent that the kidney thinks, the kidney thinks that the environment is unsafe, that there's some stress happening in the environment. And uh, what are those stresses? What could those stresses be? Well, in cardiac surgery, there are a variety of different um, stressors. Uh, in just in cardiopulmonary bypass alone, there's the circuit, there's the hemolysis, there's the tissue perfusion. By the way, it's probably less about perfusing the kidney that matters, but it's lack of perfusion to places like muscle, which then release myoglobin and other damps, which are then filtered by the glomerulus and then injure the kidney that way. But, but, but uh, probably both uh, renal perfusion as well as systemic perfusion is probably important. And then RV dysfunction. Um, which is probably much more important than we recognize. I remember, I'm old enough to remember doing cardiac surgery ICU uh, cases uh, 25 years ago when everybody was treated with inotropes. And we had less AKI, but everybody went into AFib. And then we realized that's not the good way to practice. And we moved away from inotropes for every case. And now we have less AFib and we have more AKI. And so probably uh, there's a balance there. Of course, you know, we didn't have milrinone back in those days. We, you know, we used dibutamine. But uh, there's probably uh, a balance of treating patients with higher risk for AKI uh, with inotropic support and lower risk patients avoiding it so that you avoid the, uh, the atrial fibrillation. Now, why do we know this is a stressor and not an injury? So this is some work that uh, Dave Emlett in my lab has done uh, in which we've taken, we get rejected kidneys from the local OPO. So a kidney is going to be uh, up for, for transplant, and they do a biopsy, and they say, you know, there's, there's uh, really uh, too much uh, glomerular uh, sclerosis in this kidney. Uh, we're not going to use it. So they send it to us, and we, uh, we can use about 9 out of 10 of these kidneys have uh, normal or next to normal uh, tubular uh, uh, cells, and we can get millions of viable renal tubular epithelial cells out of these kidneys. And what we do uh, with them is because we want to study cell cycle, it's difficult to do that in immortalized cell lines because they don't have normal cell cycles. So we take these primary renal epithelial cells and we culture them. You can get about six or eight passes before they lose their phenotype. Um, and you can then use that as a model system to study the effects of various um, injuries, including things that are relevant to cardiac surgery, like hemolysis. So if you incubate these cells, for example, um, well, first of all, you could do oxygen nutrient deprivation, um, which, by the way, kidney cells don't mind the deprivation. We were talking last night at, at dinner. Um, this is what you know, anesthesiologists, intensivists talk about at dinner. But we talked talk about dinner last night about, about um, uh, the fact that uh, it's not so much the, the bypass that's the problem, it's, or the cooling, it's the rewarming that's the problem. And the same thing is seen here. Cell, renal cells don't, in culture, don't really, are not really bothered by oxygen nutrient deprivation very much. What they're bothered by is the reperfusion. It's the reintroduction of the, uh, of the nutrients. And they get a big spike in biomarkers, uh, and they uh, lose uh, viability as measured by, by LDH. You can do the same thing with hemoglobin and myoglobin. Uh, if you subject these cells to hemoglobin uh, and myoglobin, you can get a uh, increase in biomarkers and a decrease in uh, viability. But what I'm showing you here is that at levels that have no effect, at no effect on LDH, Secretion. So cell viability is totally intact. These cells will still respond to the noxious stimuli of the hemoglobin or the myoglobin by increasing uh, these markers of uh, cell cycle arrest. TIMP2 and IGFPP7 go up long before there's actual damage to the cells. So these are stress markers. I, I tell my colleagues that this is sort of like an, a psychiatrist for the kidney. It's telling you when the kidney is under stress. And what we use these markers for, as I'll show you in a second, is to, uh, is to allocate resources specifically to the stress group 
and remove the non-stress group from those interventions. Equally, I use it a great deal in the ICU to identify patients that I have to worry about. Like, why is this patient's kidney still under stress? If it's not under stress, then I can, I, can, I can stop worrying about it, even if the creatinine hasn't come back down to normal, for example. Okay. Um, why does a normal kidney, uh, why does it su have such a capacity? Why does it have such a capacity to tolerate uh, injury without a rise in serum creatinine? Well, it's, it's, it's known as functional renal reserve. So if we, um, uh, if we go out to a steakhouse tonight and we all have a big steak, our GFR will increase measurably. And this study was done by giving patients hamburgers uh, to, because we were too cheap, um, and uh, their GFR goes up. And it turns out that if their GFR doesn't go up, they lack functional renal reserve, they are at high risk for developing acute kidney injury. So these are all patients that have normal resting eGFRs. They were all above 60. But about half of them, or a third of them, had a abnormal functional renal reserve. And those patients were at markedly increased risk of developing acute kidney injury. This is now, I should have put the reference on this, this is now published in, in the Annals of, uh, of, of uh, Thoracic Surgery. Um, you can do this in your clinic before the patient goes to the OR. You can say, we're going to test, we're going to do a renal stress test. We do a cardiac stress test, we do a renal stress test. Figure out whether or not you're at risk for uh, kidney injury. The other side of it, and this is not published yet, this is a paper sitting at uh, Kidney International right now, in which um, if you don't develop acute kidney injury, first of all, if you do develop acute kidney injury, so this is, um, these are patients that develop stage two, three, these are patients that develop stage one, um, they lose their functional renal reserve at three months. So they've appeared to recover, their resting GFR comes back to normal in 100% of these patients. And yet they have a defect when you do another renal stress test. Interestingly, patients that are just biomarker positive but AKI negative have the same defect. Whereas patients that have no kidney injury by either clinical evidence or biomarkers have intact renal functional reserve. So it may well be the case that many of the cases that appear to do just fine from a kidney perspective after cardiac surgery are still losing renal capacity if you provoke it with a stress test, for example, at three months. And this happens frequently uh, uh, both in cardiac surgery as well as other conditions. It turns out that uh, although two-thirds of patients who develop acute kidney injury have early reversal, these patients, many of whom uh, are, are noted to either relapse in terms of their AKI while in the hospital or have subsequent defects uh, when followed up in uh, terms of long term. Now, what can you do with all this information? Well, um, if you can tell me which patients I should not worry about after cardiac surgery, which patients can you know, have their non-steroidals to avoid their opioids, which patients can have their ACE inhibitors restarted uh, within you know, a couple days of their cardiac surgery, which patients I don't need to keep in the ICU and, and maintain uh, very careful monitoring of their hemodynamics because I'm getting pressure to send the patients out of the ICU because we all have that experience. Um, and point of fact, I think they do better if they get out of the ICU quickly as long as everything goes fine. If we monkey around with the low-risk patients in the ICU, we'll do things that probably don't benefit. We, our tensive is we can't help ourselves. But if we, if we can select the patients who don't benefit from that manipulation and get them out of the ICU, uh, we, will, we will do better. So this is what Alex Zarbach has done. Alex Zarbach has said, I'm going to measure TIMP2 and IGPP7 nephrocheck on everybody who has cardiac surgery. And if you're positive, which occurred in about a third of patients, I'm going to randomize you to get what he called a KDGO bundle. So the KDGO guideline is the, is the guideline for AKI. It was published back in 2012. Um, KDGO stands for kidney disease, improving global outcomes. I didn't make it up. Um, and this guideline suggests that you should do a variety of very common sense things, uh, avoid nephrotoxins, reduce radio contrast exposure, avoid hyperglycemia, and monitor volume status. And what he basically did was, he randomized patients to get a protocol based on that approach. And of course, what the community says is, oh, we do that always. We do that for everybody. No, you don't, and nor should you. Not everybody should have 
um, avoidance of, of uh, non-steroidals, for example. Non-steroidals are great drugs for patients that are at low risk. It keeps them away from, from opioids, which are problematic. You do want to restart your ACE inhibitors quickly in hemodynamically stable patients at low risk for AKI. Uh, now, whether you do that in the first 48 hours or not, I think is open for debate. Um, you do want to get these patients out of the ICU and away from intensivists as quickly as possible if they're low risk. So it, it's not true that you do everything, nor should you do everything for all these patients. So what he found, basically, this was his optimization protocol for fluids and inotropes. He gave a lot of inotropes, by the way, which might well have been the, the secret sauce in terms of fixing uh, AKI in this particular population. But what he found was that he had, remember, this was a very enriched group because they're all biomarker positive. So they had an AKI rate of 70%. It fell to 55% with intervention. Even stage 2, 3 AKI fell from 44% down to less than 30%. So it was a dramatic reduction in rates of AKI. Uh, what I said here in this editorial was that the myth of inevitability for cardiac surgery-associated AKI has now been shattered. There are things we can do which dramatically impact uh, the rates of AKI. Now, the last thing to talk about is um, the timing puzzle. This is another area, and I, timing, I mean timing for renal replacement therapy. Um, so we have a lot of good contradictory evidence now about timing of renal replacement therapy. And, and so I thought it would be important to talk about this. And it's very interesting. I, I'm, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't quizzed the clinicians here to find out what they do, but it's very interesting that we have very, it's almost like politics. We have very, we have very uh, contrary positions on some places really move very quickly to do renal replacement therapy in cardiothoracic surgery uh, patients. And certainly my surgeons are that way. I, I think sometimes they, 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 they just put a catheter in the, in the OR and they say, uh, you know, uh, we, we really need to get this patient's uh, uh, chest closed uh, by, by, uh, by the day after tomorrow and, I, and, I, and the patient's 15 liters up, uh, you know. And they're right. Uh, you're not gonna get that volume off uh, in, in that patient. Um, but, uh, and there are other places that just put off renal replacement therapy uh, to, the, to the very last day that they can possibly hold it off. So there's a lot of variation in terms of renal replacement therapy. And, and it's understandable that there is. This is some work that Perry Wilson did. This is not cardiac surgical patients uh, yet. Um, but this is just looking at who benefits from, acute, from renal replacement therapy when there's not an acute emergent indication. So of course, patients with potassium is eight. Uh, the patients, you know, got pulmonary edema fluid frothing off the, uh, the endotracheal tube. We're not talking about those patients. These are elective renal replacement therapy cases, which is the vast majority of our patients. They have indications, but we just don't know, should we start, should we not start? And he did an analysis where he really couldn't sort out any particular, the only real predictor was, if you were near end-stage renal disease, if you were just about on dialysis anyway, um, you, you probably should just have it because you're, you know, you probably just start early. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you weren't, there wasn't any real clear evidence that starting patients on renal replacement therapy in this kind of gray area was beneficial overall. Now, obviously, some patients benefit, some patients don't, uh, but it's very difficult to predict. There are two studies that have been published recently. This is the first one that I'll talk about from uh, France. Um, this one had a very um, had a very French approach. Uh, I'll just say that uh, the the approach was um, uh, not really trying to study early versus late, but trying to study whether you initiate renal replacement therapy now or you wait and see. You have a very relaxed approach. You kind of say, "Well, I'm not going to start it. I'm going to see what happens." And so that's the randomization scheme. I'm randomized to start renal replacement therapy. Basically, now when the patient has acute kidney injury, uh, or I'm just going to wait and see what, what happens. And the criteria were, you select patients at stage three. Uh, they had to be in the ICU on mechanical ventilation or vasopressors, and they excluded patients who had sort of a life-threatening indication, or even really an emergent, uh, not emergent, or urgent indication. For, you know, those patients were excluded. So this is a very selective population of patients who could wait and you see these patients all the time. You know, their, their creatinine's uh, gone up to four. They're a little bit fluid overloaded. They're still responding a little bit to Lasix. There's no, we're not, there's no pressure necessarily. But you wonder, should this patient receive renal replacement therapy or should we wait and see what happens? And of course, if the patient recovers, you say, well, I'm glad we waited. 
And if the patient goes on to develop complications, you say, ah, oh, we should have started. And, and, and unfortunately, many of us practice based on the last case we had, and so we go back and forth. You know, I, I regret the fact that I didn't start renal replacement therapy on Mr. Jones, so Mr. Smith is going to get it early, uh, because we just, don't, we just don't know. We just don't know what's beneficial. But what they found in this setting was that there was no difference in survival, that it didn't matter in this population whether you started early or you just wait and see what happened. But that's not the whole story. It turns out that the wait and see group falls into two categories. Half of them never received renal replacement therapy, and they had the best outcome. The other half of the wait and see group got renal replacement therapy later, and those patients did worse. So the highest mortality was in patients who you, were, you guessed wrong, you wait and saw, and you saw, um, versus the patients who you waited and they, and they recovered. Now, of course, that's obvious, right? Patients who recover will always do better than patients who fail to recover. But it's important to understand just how big of an effect this had. There was a 61.8% mortality in patients that, who were in the wait and see group who ended up receiving renal replacement therapy compared to a 37% mortality for patients who recovered. And the group that got early renal replacement therapy, of course, you can't see whether they recover because they were treated with renal replacement therapy. They had a mortality in the middle. Now, if we move from France and we go across the Maginot Line into Germany, we have a German study. Now, of course, the French study was very relaxed. We'll kind of wait and see versus early. The German study was you will receive renal replacement therapy. You will receive renal replacement And you're either going to get it at stage two or you're going to get it at stage three. That was, the, that was the randomization scheme. And these were predominantly, it wasn't 100%, but these were predominantly cardiac surgical patients. So this is much more uh, in line with our, whereas the French study, mostly medical ICU patients, a lot of sepsis, different population. This is mostly cardiac surgery, and, it's a, and it's, it fits actually our practice. My surgeons will breathe down my neck if I'm not starting renal replacement therapy on a, state, on a patient who's cardiac surgery who hits stage three. Why? Because they kind of intuitively understand what I showed you with that, that, that figure, that in fact these patients have horrible outcomes if they get to stage three. Um, and remember, it's not because stage three by creatinine, it's stage three by urine output, typically where all the numbers are. Those patients are fluid overloaded, they can't get the chest closed, the RV's failing, the patient's in the ICU on a ventilator, they develop pneumonia. It's, it's, so getting those patients, getting the fluid off in those patients is, is quite important. So I think this matches our clinical experience much more than the French study, but you have to recognize that it's a different approach. This is basically saying, I'm either going to randomize you to stage two or I'm going to treat you at stage three. And only the few patients, handful of patients who recovered between stage two and stage three were excluded from the treatment, but they were kept in the analysis. And what Alex Arbach has shown, and, and I was on this paper just because I helped with the biomarkers, um, what Alex showed was that early renal replacement therapy had a better outcome. Starting at stage two was better than waiting till stage three in this population. So now we have very different results from two studies in Europe. Not huge studies, a few hundred patients each, uh, but big enough. Um, uh, what I think is happening basically is that um, you're really comparing apples to oranges. The Elaine study, which was the, the, uh, the study done uh, in Germany, uh, was really looking at a very early stage, whereas the Akiki study already excluded most of the patients who would have been eligible for the Elaine trial, and is really asking a very different question. It's basically saying, okay, I've already waited, and I've decided this patient can wait, and I think they've got a reasonable chance of recovering, and in their hands it was 50%. It's okay to wait further. And I think that's probably right. I think if you think the patient has a low risk, less than 50% of requiring renal replacement therapy on this admission, you're probably better off waiting. If, on the other hand, you're committed you're saying to yourself, this patient's not getting better, I'm starting renal replacement therapy, then actually the German data suggests that you're better off starting it sooner. And that's pretty much how we practice. Now, I have to say to you, it's still not easy because there are patients who you see on a Monday, they come out of the OR, they're positive uh, a few liters already, they're not making much urine, you start them on some Lasix, they haven't responded, should you give it the night or should you just go ahead and start renal replacement therapy that night? I don't know the answer to that.
I don't know the answer to that. This is the follow-up data just published in JSON, uh, showing that this signal of benefit persisted even when you go out to one year. So early renal replacement therapy patients in this trial did better even at one year if they were treated with renal replacement therapy at stage two versus going on to stage three. So in conclusion, yeah, AKI and cardiac surgery, it's a thing. Um, it's a thing. Isolated oliguria, however, only pretends a worse prognosis, really, it says two, three here, but it's really not until stage three. These isolated oligurics, even at stage two, even 12 hours of oliguria after cardiac surgery, probably not associated with long-term adverse effects in patients, at least in our hands. Uh, it's a different thing than sepsis, for example, where stage two is strongly associated with mortality. Clinical AKI, creatinine urine output, may just be the tip of the iceberg. When there's biomarker evidence of injury, uh, sort of subclinical AKI, uh, silent AKI, if you will, uh, is a real thing as well. And loss of, fun of functional reserve is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that occurs, and it's potentially important both in terms of selecting high-risk patients prior to OR and monitoring patients uh, in terms of their risk long-term. Preventing AKI can reduce long-term clinical complications, although mortality is not easy to show in this population um, uh, because of the reasons that I talk about. If you, if you pick the patients that have very severe AKI, it's a small N. Uh, it's only 20% of the patients, now only 20%, one in five of our cardiac surgery patients will have a severe AKI event, and that will dramatically jeopardize their chance of being alive and free of dialysis at 90 days. But it's hard to do big, it's hard to do modestly sized clinical trials with event rates in the, in the, in the 20s. Current evidence does not support early renal replacement therapy for all patients. But for patients that you've decided you're going to provide renal replacement therapy if they don't recover, giving a very short window to see if they recover is probably reasonable practice because if you delay and they don't recover, their mortalities are, are higher than patients that are started on renal replacement therapy early. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for a great presentation. Your, uh, you know, work with biomarkers. Uh, have you utilized, do you utilize Nephrocheck as part of your diagnostic or management or anything in any role in your patients? And how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I use the, frankly, I use the markers not the way that I would recommend using them. I think the, I would recommend using them. I mean, I just sort of, you know, I use the markers. Um, but, but the way I think you should use the markers is the way Alex Arbach used the markers. You measure it on everybody. Because what you learn is the patients who don't uh, have a signal and you expect that they do, and the patients that do and you didn't think they would, those are the cases. If you're just selective, if you're cherry picking the cases, then all you're doing is confirmational bias. You're basically saying, oh, I think this patient's high risk for AK. I sent off a marker, and oh yeah, they're high risk for AK. Okay, what did I really learn there? If, on the other hand, you measure it, patients you don't think are very high risk, uh, and they turn out to be positive, then you okay, I, I, and I have many examples of that. I, I, uh, I, we did a, uh, this was about six months ago, we did a, a, a VAD, and this was a, none of these are that straightforward, but this was about as straightforward as any VAD ever is, right? The patient came out late in the afternoon. I, I saw the patient about seven o'clock at night before I uh, went home. The patient was on a bit of epinephrine, uh, you know, by morning, Still a little bit of epinephrine, but it was weaned uh, almost completely off. Patient was extubated. Everything looked good, except the nurse told us on rounds, they said, he's not really making that much urine. And this has been going on for the last few hours. It's kind of dwindling. And CVP was 12. The outputs were great. There was nothing wrong hemodynamically. And I you know, turned to the team, and I said, what do you want? Half of them said, give fluid. The other half said, give Lasix. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know. And, and I, said, uh, I said, I'm not really sure we should do either. Why don't you send a biomarker? If the kidney's not under stress, which I fully expected, then I'm not going to be under stress. Well, I'm not going to do anything. And uh, I go up to my office to take a conference call, and the fellow texts me and says, the biomarker's four. And, and the normal range is less than you know, 0.3, right? So 
how can this be? And I said, well, get an echo. He said, I've already, I've already uh, echoed the patient. Everything looks OK. That's bizarre. And so I called up the surgeon, and I said, I said, Bob, I said, I said, your patient's going into renal failure. Why is that? Of course, the patient wasn't. You know, I mean, they just had some oliguria. But the biomarker's so high. And I said, Bob, your patient might well, get, get a CT scan. I said, we did an echo. He said, get a CT scan. And so he gets a CT scan, and sure enough, the guy's got a clot, and you know, he's got uh, pressure on the, on the IVC, and uh, goes back to the OR, gets the clot removed, the IVC's uh, uh, now paid. And nothing, there's nothing that was obvious, okay? And even, even the surgeon agrees. It's hard to get the surgeons to agree. Even the surgeon agrees. <laughs> even the surgeon agrees that we, we, got a, we, we, we probably made that diagnosis 24 hours earlier than we would have. Because normally what we would have done was we would have either given Lasix, or we would have given volume, and neither of those would have been the right answer, and the patient would have kind of progressively worse, and then we would have finally said, oh, he's going into renal failure. But because we had a biomarker, we got 12 hours or 24 hours lead time on that um, and, and figured it out. And so I use, I use the test in those situations quite a lot, uh, but I think the way it should be used is actually as a protocol across the entire, for cardiac surgery. Because cardiac surgery is already so high risk that you really don't need to select these patients. I mean, I guess you could take out some of the really low risk cases, um, you know. But for the rest of them, the risk is high enough that it's probably worth using in all of them. Sir. Great talk. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I agree, it's hard to get surgeons to agree. The, uh, my question is, what, you know, what we know is that patients that go into renal failure, certainly in cardiac surgery, uh, have not only higher mortality, longer length of stays, they're very expensive patients in the system. Um, how about identifying patients that you think before they go to cardiac surgery they're at risk? Have, have you done any work or has your group done any work with those groups of patients that may be at risk of developing renal dysfunction and doing anything to avoid that? Yeah, so there's a few things that, that uh, and it's a long conversation, but we, we can have a, a, a short version of it uh, here. Um, th there's a few things that come to mind, right? So the first thing is, is if you can identify patients that are at particularly high risk, you may make decisions around the operative plan in a little bit different way. So if you're sort of on, the, you say, you know, I do off pump and I do on pump and, you know, I'm trying to decide whether I should do for that. You might actually make that decision if the patient's at really high risk for AKI because using an off pump technique does reduce. Now, granted, the problem with off pump is it's been shown to be associated with worse mortality. So you wouldn't want to select that for all patients, but you might make that decision. More, more, um, a, a, a more common scenario might be, and we see this all the time, that patients, uh, you know, having chest pain, uh, they're in the uh, the, CT, the, uh, uh, car, the CCU, uh, they're they're uh, ruling in for a little uh, 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 non-STEMI, uh, and uh, they, they head to the cath lab, and they've got triple vessel disease, and they've got a balloon pump in, and they've had a big contrast load. A lot of those patients are primed for AKI regardless of whether they go to cardiac surgery or not. Now, you might decide, you got to do the case, but you might decide maybe it's better to just let that case cool off for a few days. If they're going to develop their AKI, get that pat and then do the cardiac surgery. So you may make decisions about uh, what you do. The rest of it is stuff that I don't deal with. The rest of it is things like, uh, you know, some of our surgeons really like to run at the very uh, limits of flow, low flow, uh, to keep the field dry and all this stuff and monitor the brain, but don't necessarily put uh, very much in place to, to monitor. And you can't really monitor the kidney. But if you knew the patient was high risk, you might say, well, I'll tolerate higher flows during the case because this patient's at particular risk. So I think there's a package of things that you would do preoperative, you know, even, even, even before. And it may well be, it may well be that this notion of actually doing a renal stress test is something that'll all, uh, that eventually make it into uh, standard practice. Because, you know, if I had an EGFR, you know, my EGFR is 75. Um, and if I was gonna undergo cardiac surgery, you know, I might like to know, well, what's my, what's my functional renal reserve? Because if, if it's fine, I might say to the surgeon, look, don't worry about my kidneys. I know, I know you don't want to give me AKI because I'll talk about it, okay? But, but, but I'm really low risk, so just do what you think is best. If, on the other hand, I was really high risk, I might tell a surgeon, I might say, gosh, you know, 
I, I know, you know, maybe, maybe you should keep the flows higher. Maybe you should, you know, and for God's sake, don't put me on a non-steroidal. And for God's sake, uh, even if I ask for it, don't give it to me. Uh, and for God's sake, don't restart my ACE inhibitor until I'm uh, in the clear and all that kind of stuff. So I do think there's a whole bunch of things. It's, the problem is that it isn't simple, right? It's not like cardiology where I say the answer is go to the cath lab, you know. <laughs> you know, there's not a simple answer. The answer is you've got to kind of select what you do based on the patient's risk factors. Um, what do you, do you think the, the concepts of stage one and two oliguria apply to the low output cardiogenic shock patients too? Or is, and uh, second question is continuous versus intermittent dialysis. What's your, what's your take on that? Probably what, what, was the, what was the second question? The, the concept that stage one and two oliguria and without, you know, significant decrease, uh, increase in creatinine, you know, we talked about cardiac surgery patients, but what about low output cardiogenic shock yeah, patients? That yeah, are With mechanical yeah. devices and so on sure, and so forth. Sure, sure. And, but then you had a question after that. And then that. the second one is intermittent dialysis versus continuous dialysis and CRT. Yeah, versus. oh yeah, so sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, yeah. so quickly, my take on all of that is as follows. So I think that, and I think one of the things we've learned by doing these kinds of analysis is that different patients are different. Different populations are very different. I think cardiac surgery is a very different story from cardiogenic shock, for example. The patient who's cardiogenic shock is almost always fluid overloaded, uh, so they're not dry. Uh, whereas a patient coming out of the OR where the perfusionist has said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off as much volume as the patient tolerates, which, you know, is often what happens. The patient comes out very dry. Um, so it's a very different story. A patient who's oliguric with cardiogenic shock, uh, often what you see, in fact, in that population is, is they continue to accumulate fluid and you dilute their serum creatinine. So it's blunted in terms of the rise. If you adjust for all the fluid overload, you find that they actually have a much higher serum creatinine than they, than they so the oliguria is often a very strong indicator of adverse effects in that population. So you have, to, you have to select, as your question is suggesting, you have to select the population that you're interpreting. The second question is, is regard to the type of, uh, of renal replacement therapy. In the cardiothoracic IC, we don't use any intermittent hemodialysis until the patient's well after there. In fact, I have a hard time getting my, in my center, just to tell you how far we've gone in that direction. Um, I can't even get IHD in the ICU when I want it most of the time because the dialysis center says, you know, hey, I, I you know, I, I, I've got, I, you know, I have nurses with overtime. I, I, can't, I can't send a nurse. You've got a nurse there. Just put the patient on CRT. What's your problem? Um, you know, and so, and so I, I, middle of the night, potassium's 10. I can't get a, a IHD. I have to put the patient on CRT. That's, that's where we are, okay? And it's all about just the logistics. In terms of, you know, do you use IHD or you use CRT, my, my sense is that if you know what you're doing, you can use either uh, technique. It's just a lot harder to manage a hemodynamically unstable patient. It's really a lot harder. And it doesn't fit the budget very well, right? Because what the dialysis unit wants to do is they want to send this patient, this, uh, this uh, nurse who's getting paid overtime out of the a dialysis unit, they want to do a three-hour session three days a week. And that doesn't fit with what I need to do for my patients uh, in the ICU. I need much more, uh, uh, much more fluid management than that. I can't get all that fluid off in a three-hour session. So, so that's a problem. If you're willing to say, look, I, I'm going to do seven hours of therapy. I'm going to do it daily for the next three days. Then, yeah, you can use intermittent therapy. Uh, otherwise, you're sort of stuck with CRT. Thank you very much, John. Um, that was an awesome talk, and uh, I think it stimulated a lot of thought here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, you, you talk about is fluid, um, and the majority of the fluid that we give is, you know, obviously crystalloid. Um, and uh, we had a speaker come last week who discussed um, the sodium load uh, and how that could be also you know, a problem for the kidney because we give a lot of normal saline and LR. And is there any, uh, you know, there, in, in the literature it does say that normal saline is not normal. Uh, so uh, what do you recommend for a balanced crystalloid? Yeah, we don't use, we don't use any saline uh, um, except that when I'm not around, they do. 
you know, it's amazing. I round in the ICU. It doesn't matter what ICU I round in. Uh, you know, uh, we gave this patient three liters of plasma light. I said, okay, very good. Another unit. Nobody uses saline until you look in the data and you find there's quite a lot of saline actually being used. About half our patients get uh, get saline. So somebody's using it somewhere. I don't know where it is, but frankly, I don't think there's much indication for 0.9% saline. The only indication I have for 0.9% saline is somebody who's been over-diuresed because those patients have lack of volume as well as lack of uh, chloride, and they have a, a, a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, and they're perfectly treated with 0.9% saline, but practically nobody else. Uh, everyone else I'm either giving lactated ringers to, or if I want an isotonic balanced solution, I'm giving uh, plasma light. And that's just what I'm, what I'm doing. And I, I'm concerned about two things related to that, right? One is I'm concerned about the salt load, which you suggested, but not just the sodium, I'm also concerned about the chloride. Uh, so every, every liter of 0.9% saline has nine grams, nine grams of salt. So you're on a low cardiac diet, low salt cardiac diet, two and a half grams, two grams a day. You've just given the patient a week's worth of salt uh, if you're giving them a liter of fluid. And it's the one thing you can do. We have these drive-by saline shootings in my hospital, right? Because anybody, we have electronic medical, you, from home, you can order a liter of, of saline, right? And, you know, I spent the whole day trying to remove fluid from the patient and some Yahoo you know, on the orthopedic surgery service, hasn't seen the patient, orders a liter of fluid. And, you know, my nurses are pretty, they, you know, will pick, often pick that up and say, do you want me to give this? And I'll say, no. Uh, but sometimes they get it. And, uh, you know, it seems like it's the one thing that's never wrong. You know, what did you do for this patient? I did X, Y, and Z. And no one ever says, why did you give the patient a liter of fluid? And we have to get better about that. And then the second thing is the chloride. Uh, producing hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis is un unnecessary, okay? It might not matter that much to the typical patient. Uh, but if you're uh, at risk, if you're already acidotic and I give you uh, a chloride load, you're going to be more acidotic. And why would I want that? I have to crank up the ventilator and create more lung injury. I've got to do all kinds of other things. It produces hemodynamic instability. Why would I do that? Uh, so if I'm going to use crystalloid, which is what I use, I mean, I use very little colloid. Uh, we still have, uh, in cardiac surgery, we still have a lot of albumin use. Uh, I'm usually using crystalloid. When I'm using crystalloid, it's a balanced solution. So lactated ringers or plasma, or plasma light. light, yeah. Okay. A lot of LR. I, I frankly use a lot of LR. Okay. And then the albumin, um, that also is a so sodium load as well, no? It is. It is. Um, but you're giving a lot less of it. So one of the rationale for giving albumin is, you know, if I can give 250 cc's of albumin versus two liters of saline, you know, I'm better off. And I'm, and I'm talking about 5%, obviously, if I'm giving, yeah. you know. 20% uh, of it giving that much, that's a big deal. But yeah, I don't know where I'll be. So it turns out that we've done some analyses, which I haven't published yet because I'm still trying to, <laughs> trying to work out the data. Um, but it, there, is a, there does appear to be a protective signal for some patients given albumin. If they really get a lot of fluid, if, the, if albumin is part of the resuscitation, there seems to be some protection. And I don't know what, whether that's related residual confession. I shouldn't even talk about it because I'm not sure, quite sure about it yet. But, but I can't make it go away in these analyses. And so I'm not sure about albumin in select patients. I'm quite sure that saline's the devil's juice, and we should stay away from that. Thank you, Mary. All right.